from childhood i had always felt that our country is under foreign occupation and uh, the country that we are born into the country that we are growing up in uh, is not ours and we have to eventually return to our own country the pride of being in my own country i've lost that because I'm all the time a refugee. I've lost my country, but at least I am struggling and working. The struggle gives me the dignity. And for me, so long as I could continue with this struggle, it would, uh, continue, it, it would continue to give me a purpose of life. Definitely, we are unarmed. We don't have any weapons. We don't have any violent trainings as such. But if today China is afraid of somebody, is most afraid of somebody, it is the peaceful forces of the Tibetans. In exile as well as inside Tibet. For a non-violent liberation movement to show that it can succeed, in a world that is really addicted to militarism and violence, this movement becomes even more important for everyone. So we believe we have strength in the form of peace, non-violence, and our commitment. Whenever we face problems, different interests, this agreement, the realistic method is non-violent dialogue. The tragedy of this saga is the dilution of what was once a clear-cut mass movement for independence into a lethargic, non-violent freedom struggle, which no government supports and has no takers anywhere when support and affirmative action are needed. We haven't tried uh, to have a movement that is non-violent, but is also like active, that is also proactive, you know, where we are not passive, where we are uh, pushing the fight to them. And I think that's, I feel that's uh, the direction in which we have to take our uh, movement. Whatever happens, it will happen peacefully, non-violently, but we are not giving up. Whatever happens, let them beat us, let them put us in jail, let them detain us for many months. Let them even shoot us. But we are committed to go to Tibet. We are going back to our own country. And we don't have to seek permission for anybody. It's an example of people deciding that they've had enough. They have to do something. At least they can do something to draw attention to the situation in Tibet. And that's, we need to do more of that. And I think we can be successful. The disenchanted Tibetan youth of today now struggle with the choice between Rangzin and the middle path, autonomy or independence. No matter how loudly the Tibetans protest and shout for their sovereignty, China is least bothered, and a satisfactory result is as distant as ever. To my mind, uh... I think the independence option is always going to be there. Even if we go for autonomy, and even if we get autonomy at some stage, in the hearts of the people, they will still want independence. So that will never, that will never go away. Because every Tibetan automatically will say Rangzen, but then you know they'll immediately say, oh, but we are not supposed to say Rangzen. We are supposed to say autonomy, and otherwise we are going against his business wishes. So there's this confusion is there all the time. I don't find any contradiction in these two. To me, it appears that this is a part of an overall struggle. The problem with the Tibetan movement is this bullshit about you're either for the middle way or you're for Rangzen. Everyone should be for both. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous to claim that these are uh, antithetical. No, 
Even though the Dalai Lama is negotiating, of course, he is presenting his middle path. I think it's completely appropriate for the Dalai Lama to try to negotiate some kind of compromise with the Chinese. That's his job. He's the leader of the Tibetan people, and I think the Tibetan government acts also. For them to try to negotiate, to try to compromise, to try to get some improvement for the Tibetan people inside Tibet, that's a very good and very positive thing. He knows he cannot get independence for Tibet. He has no, no weapon to do that. He can't get independence for Tibet from the Chinese. They're not going to give independence. One of the things is when the China had Tibet, right? and then they reach so many borders. If they don't have Tibet, then they have less access to other countries, and plus all these mineral resources. So in that way, its chances of uh, giving to someone is very rare, I feel, unless there's something big change in China itself. Jesus, I'm